Chad AC Show, News Talk KFYO. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We go to the phones. And Republican strategist Matt McCoviang joins us this morning. Matt, good morning. How are you today? Morning, Chad. I'm doing great. How about you? Doing great. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. It's it's obviously a uh, pretty important day uh, for the U.S. Senate as the Senate is debating a stimulus package. Matt, what do, what do we know? Where are we right now as as far as the stimulus package goes, and and what exactly is going on in the House? Yeah. So um, we know that a bipartisan deal that had been negotiated over the weekend with a number of Democratic senators, got blown up when Speaker Pelosi came back from a 10-day vacation on Sunday night. Um, and, you know, the, the, the cloture vote, so-called cloture vote, which is a procedural vote to end, end debate and get, on, and, and get on a bill before you, you know, so you can consider changes and ultimately get a final vote, um, failed Sunday night and then failed again Monday morning. Um, that has... Not that is you know profound uh, timing uh, repercussions. You know the Senate has very specific rules, and unless you get cloture on a bill, you have to wait a certain number of days before it can come back, unless there's a unanimous consent, unless every single senator agrees. And so, uh, I think right now we're looking at the earliest you could have a vote would be Friday, and that's just that's just on Senate bill, right? You still have to pass it through the House, and the House may choose to amend it. So you could potentially go to a conference committee. So. For everyone out there listening who's maybe lost their job or their wages have been cut or they're not sure if they may lose their job, you know, that's, uh, playing, Democrats are playing games right now. Um, now, it does appear this morning and the stock market uh, is reflecting that uh, they may be closing in on a bipartisan deal that made some changes to the original bill. Now, the big question I'm sure you have that I have as well that I don't know the answer to yet is, is you know, how much of Pelosi's ridiculous left-wing stuff got is, is in the final agreement. The only thing we know is that there are going to be additional oversight mechanisms with the $500 billion fund the Treasury will will see to support industries that are in in real danger. I imagine that's airlines, uh, maybe the cruise cruise industry, restaurants, things like that. Uh, Apparently, there's going to be an inspector general for that fund, and there's apparently going to be a five-member congressional panel as well of oversight. Um, We don't know whether the, you know, increasing emissions for airlines or the collective bargaining stuff or the election security money or, uh, God, I don't even remember all the ridiculous left-wing stuff that had nothing, that corporate diversity on board, on corporate, diversity on corporate boards, all these different provisions Pelosi has in her bill that she wanted in the the Senate bill. We don't know if those are going to be in there. Uh, She was on CNBC this morning saying she doesn't want to see any poison pills uh, in in the uh, the uh, agreed to bipartisan bill. So I imagine she means things Democrats can't accept. Um, but my hope is that most, if not all of those things are not going to be in the final product. That's not what this is about. It's about saving the country, uh, not about achieving every left wing hope, uh, hope and dream that uh, progressives have had for decades. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you look at, and, and you uh, tweeted out or uh, retweeted a thread from yesterday yeah. That I mean, you go through it, and the things that are in here, Matt. I, I mean, uh, you know, in Nancy Pelosi's bill, this again, this is a bill targeting coronavirus. She wants to spend two hundred and seventy-eight million on the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, she she wants to spend thirty-five million for the JFK Performing Arts Center. I, I, I again, <laughs> I, you know, when people are suffering out there. I mean, how can how and, and you've got the New York Times blaming Mitch McConnell for this. I mean, how people should be outraged. I mean, absolutely outraged by this. No question. Uh, no question. And if you imagine a scenario where everything was reversed, we had a Democratic president. You had you know a Democratic uh, Democratic Senate a majority leader and a Republican House minority leader, and and McCarthy or Boehner as minority leader in the House or excuse me, Speaker of the House, was uh, making, you know, right-wing demands, um, you know, all, during, during a crisis or during an emergency. Uh, you know, the, the invective and the blame game on that against that Republican would be absolutely overwhelming. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, the, the silence really does speak volumes. You know, as you said, the New York Times editorial board had an editorial blaming McConnell. Uh, as absurd as that is, they spent all weekend with Democratic senators and working groups uh, 
finalizing uh, the list of, of things. McConnell said something like, I forget, Schumer put a list out of things he wanted. I think it was 30 separate items he wanted in the coronavirus phase three bill. The Republicans agreed to 28 of them. 28 of them. And so Schumer on Saturday made very positive comments about the bipartisan work that was being done. Uh, for whatever reason, Pelosi said on Sunday she was going to blow this up because she wanted to get more out of this bill. So it reminds you a little bit of the Rahm Emanuel line of never let a crisis go to waste. They recognize this may be the only major piece of legislation that passes the rest of this year, given that we're in the presidential election year, and they're going to try to achieve as much as they can. It is outrageous. It's ridiculous. Uh, but already we're seeing the national media really provide cover for Pelosi, not hold her accountable at all, and not even really present the facts in a, in a, direct, in a direct way. Visiting with Matt McCoviak, Republican strategist. Matt, uh, the president's Poll numbers look like uh, they're they're going up. Most people look like they are actually approving of the job uh, the president is doing right now. Uh, The president starting to have a pivot in his tone uh, as far as what happens after, you know, week 15 of this social distancing. Do you do you blame? Do you think he's he's right to have a pivot in tone? Do you think it's too early? Do you think, uh, you know, in, in many ways, I mean, we can't be shut down for three to four months, can we? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, unless unless this outbreak becomes a national phenomenon where not just 10 counties have 50 percent of the cases, but where it's really – and it's not an urban you know problem only, but when it really starts affecting rural areas as well, um, I do think that there's going to be pressure here in two or three weeks to, to go to some – back to some semblance of normal – We'll see what this ultimate uh, phase three package uh, has, what kind of direct support it has to workers, um, you know, if it's going to save jobs, if it's going to provide interest-free loans to small business, how quickly all that helps to get there. I mean, look, a lot of people, they, they ran on the first of the month, and April 1st is coming around pretty quick, and, and there's no way in hell Congress is going to have checks in people's bank accounts by April 1st uh, because it is due during this week. So. Uh, you are right that um, that po- tr- the polling that we've seen, I think I've seen three separate polls that have had Trump at or above 50% in terms of job approval on his response to this. Um, that obviously is going to drive the, 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 the national media and the left wing crazy uh, because they have been relentless in their attacking of the president from the very beginning. And look, I do think there are probably a couple areas where, where some criticism is warranted. We, we didn't ramp up testing quite fast enough. Uh, you, can, you could argue the administration was not aggressive enough early on. Uh, but uh, clearly in the last couple, two, three weeks, they've really uh, turned turned the corner and are, are taking very aggressive steps, working very closely with the governors. Look, you have a situation where four states are, are, are providing most of the cases, California, Washington, New York, New Jersey. Those states, it is a crisis in those states, far beyond what we're dealing with in Texas and far beyond what, what, what's happening anywhere else. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I think you may see discussed here in the next couple of weeks is, um, you know, do you have different policies for those states? Do you have a shelter in place in those four states, but not in the other 46 states? One of the challenges, one of the blessings, but challenges we have is that the governors and local officials are running uh, emergency response and policy in these states. And so it's not up to the president whether we have a nationwide shelter in place order, which I think, number one, wouldn't really be um, – uh, wouldn't most people probably wouldn't do. But number two, that's just not how our system works. Um, you know, the federal government provides resources, but it does not – execute emergency response at the local and statewide level. It's up to governors and county judges and mayors. And so every state, every locality has their own policy. You know, it, it, it's almost like, and, and I don't think the majority of people are learning this, but we're almost getting a civics test, aren't we? With yeah. with, with how all of this is is developing is that you can't, you can't exactly look to the federal government for every single little thing. A lot of this does come down to individual states. And, and, you know, when you have a state like Texas, it's so different and and, and so diverse. You know, I, I got a feel for Greg Abbott, you know, who, you know, some people say we need a statewide shutdown. Other people say we don't need one because 200 counties don't have any uh, cases of coronavirus. Yeah. I think he's handled this situation well, uh, Governor Abbott. What, what do you think? I do, too. Um, you know, look, again, his situation is totally different from New York State. And honestly, it's really New York City that, that's, that's in, in crisis right now. You can, you can understand why. I mean, you know, all the international travel, particularly from China, uh, that, that, that we've seen over, you know, that you see on a daily basis, which, of course, was stopped by the president. But, but, but there, were some effect, there was some effect before that policy went into effect. Um, 
But you're right. I mean, it's really hard to tell rural counties you got to shut every business down um, and your people have to go home uh, when they don't. There's really no, no threat whatsoever at the moment, and particularly when when people aren't traveling, when people are so you know utilizing social distancing, uh, the risk of community spread in, in communities where it doesn't exist is really low right now. And so the goal is to keep it as low as possible for as long as possible. So we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. So I agree with you. I think the governor's handled it really well. He's got another update this afternoon. So you know we'll see. He's basically said he doesn't believe from a statewide perspective we need shelter in place, but he understands if particular areas want to put one in place. And so you have one in Dallas now. I think you have one in Houston. As of today, you'll have one in Austin and San Antonio. And in those urban areas, that probably makes sense. We have something like I want to say 60 or 70 cases now in the greater Austin area. Um, that number is, has gone up considerably. Um, but, you know, does that make sense for a rural county in our you know, northwest of Austin that has you know, no cases and maybe maybe no county around it has a case? Um, no, it probably doesn't make sense in those areas. So, you know, I, again, I think it's, um, you know, we elect uh, people to office to handle crises, and we have to you know, rely on their wisdom, their judgment. They have more information. They're being advised by experts. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you can't criticize or question elected officials, but at some level, you've got to have a certain amount of trust. Uh, Matt Mikowiak, uh, tell folks uh, where they can uh, obviously sign up for your newsletter and also what uh, what your uh, where they can hear your podcast. Yeah, the latest uh, the latest podcast episode is on this coronavirus. We just interviewed uh, the uh, a recent director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Elias. Uh, Zerhuni, uh, great conversation, really in depth about the virus. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, the Map on Politics podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, uh, and the newsletter, which I know you subscribe to. More than three thousand Texans receive it every weekday morning. It's called Must Read Texas. Take all the top news from around the state, put in one clean, easy to read email, and deliver it to inboxes around nine a.m. every weekday morning. You can sign up for a free one week trial at MustReadTexas.com. All right. Matt, as always, appreciate your time, and we'll visit with you next week. Take care. That's Matt Makoviak here on the Chad HD Show. We'll take our break when we come back. Your phone calls and more.